When you want to know what the Word of God says, about a particular matter, you can simply open up a Bible and see what it says, but, if you want to be absolutely certain about it, you can research it more closely, by using the 1611 King James Bible, and then go even deeper by reading Strong's Concordance, and examining either the Hebrew, or the Textus Receptus Greek text. I think at least all Christian viewers can agree, that God's word is truth, but here, on earth, in the domain of Satan, truth has become a dirty word, and the truth is systematically attacked on all sides, not least the word of God and the Holy Bible. I think most of us know that there are different Bible versions out there and indeed, many different translations. If someone just wants to get a basic idea of what it's all about, then they will usually pick one which is easy to read, and in some cases, people will choose a Bible which is in line with their own views. The choice of which Bible to read is dependent upon several different factors. What kind of church a person belongs to, and what is taught there, and, how serious the individual takes their faith. And if indeed, the person is a genuine Christian, or just a passive moderate, using the Christian title, but still with one foot in the world. Because the deception of the last days is so powerful, even leading the elect astray, it is imperative that Christians pray that the Holy Spirit show them the truth, about every spiritual matter. Instead of putting confidence in men, take nothing for granted, but examine all things and pray that the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth, which he has promised to do. There is a lot of text in this video, but I hope by the end of it, you will understand just how important this message is, especially because some people may have never known some of the things I am going to reveal in this video presentation. The struggles I've faced in making it. Tell me how vitally important it is. There is a lot going on in the world today, things which can easily shift the focus off what is really important, because if we are not walking in the truth, then we quickly become cannon fodder for deceiving spirits, and become absorbed into the enemy's smokescreen tactics. In a recent video, I spoke about the Mandela Effect. Some of us had the vision to see it for what it was, and why the hesitation to swallow it, because now the enemy forces are trying to say that they changed the Bible, so it is not reliable. The whole charade is nothing less than psyops to discredit the word of God, but to those who know, and hold fast to the truth, we can see the lie for what it really is. You remember earlier, when I was talking about the methods we can use to verify what it the Bible says about a particular subject, and in reference to the Greek text, I said we can check what is called the Textus Receptus. I said that, because many Bibles, New Testament are not translated from the Textus Receptus, but rather from Alexandrian codices, translated by Westcott and Hort. The alternative texts, used by Westcott and Hort, came from the Vatican Library and, the Sinai, but they were not in the Greek language, but rather in Coptic, and the task of translation to Greek was undertaken by Westcott and Hort. The Coptic language used, placed the origin of these texts in the region of Alexandria, Egypt, hence the name, the Alexandrian Codices. It was theorized that since these texts were older than any of the 5,000 that had been used by the 1611 King James Committee, they might reveal a more authoritative text, being closer in time to the events described in the New Testament, and indeed, 
startling and shocking differences did seem to suddenly appear. The resurrection story in the book of Mark was gone. The last 12 verses of the KJV. Also gone was Acts 8 37 where the Ethiopian eunuch confesses Jesus as the Son of God, along with many, many other passages. It's important at this point to understand that Alexandria, was a center of Gnosticism, and occultism, and indeed, many of today's New Age philosophies can be traced back to there. We need to spend a couple of minutes addressing the KJV only, controversy, because as I'm sure many people know, this is something of a divider when it comes to studying God's Word. Some people won't use any other Bible than the authorized King James, others bitterly reject the notion, so what's behind it all? I think it's fair to say that many of the people who prefer the KJV, even with its old English text, don't really know why it is considered to be the most accurate and true translation, but they know that there are things missing from most modern translations, which are in the KJV, and that in itself is proof enough of its reliability and accuracy. It is true to say with 90% plus certainty, the text is Receptus, and therefore, the authorized 1611, KJV, translated from Textus Receptus, has been vindicated as the more authoritative text, rather than versions based on the Alexandrian translation by Westcott and Hort, which was not only a corrupted version, but history tells us that these men also had a sinister agenda as well. But does that mean that we can't use any other Bible? Well, that really depends upon who we are, and how important the truth is to us, and also, what it is we are trying to find out. In today's electronic age, it's very easy to open up a page, which will show you side-by-side -side comparisons of all popular Bibles out there making it easy to see the differences, and how important they are. It's also important to note, that the differences in translation, are often not only different wording, but sometimes, whole verses, or sentences are omitted. An example is coming up next to highlight this point. The question is, how important is it for a person to know they are not only being called, but being called to repent and change? A seasoned believer would most likely know the difference, but a newborn Christian, just coming out of the vile filth of the world, could be under the impression that no repentance is necessary. Sounds familiar no? It's fair to say, that although the example only showed the text omitted from the NIV, the same text is also omitted from many other versions as well, including the ESV, NASB, ASV, ERV etc. I could probably spend another 30 minutes or so going over some serious omissions and changes, as there are a lot, but I think we get the overall picture, and that it's a serious matter overall. The big question is then, are we not seeking truth and are we not true followers of Christ, if we use a Bible other than the KJV? I think the answer is different for different people. My opinion for what it's worth, is that if you use another Bible, but regularly cross-reference the KJV, and either the Textus Receptus or Hebrew, then you are pretty safe, but, if you just accept what any Bible says at face value, then you are potentially headed for problems. Take me for instance, here in Norway. English is not the first language, and people who are 40 plus don't use it very often. I can't give them a KJV, or even read them passages directly from the KJV, because it would be too difficult to understand, which is hardly surprising, because many younger, Native English speakers can also have difficulty with Old English text. With the discovery of the Nag Hammadi, 
Gnostic library in the 1940s, it became clear that the early unorthodox sect, known as the Gnostics, did not believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. Nor did they really believe in his humanity either. They believed he was a guiding spirit, sent to earth by the true God, not the Yahweh of the Old Testament, incidentally, whom they considered to be a blind, insane angel who created the material world against Sophia's wisdom that is, the true God's will. Jesus' mission, according to the Gnostics, was to impart special knowledge, or gnosis, to spirits trapped in this material world seeking release. Thus, Jesus never died on the cross, was never resurrected, was not God, nor was he human. Unsurprisingly then, all the altered or missing texts in the Alexandrian Gnostic codices, always happen to involve one, or a combination of these subjects regarding Jesus' divinity. And the center of operations, for the unorthodox sect from which these texts came from, was indeed Alexandria, Egypt. Some may say, wait. Westcott and Hort were both ordained ministers in the Church of England, which they were, but there again, so are many Masons. Both Westcott and Hort praised evolutionists, socialists, and modernists, but they were bitterly critical of evangelical soul winners. Westcott criticized the work of William Booth in the Salvation Army. Hort criticized the Crusades of D.L. Moody. Hort criticized the soul winning Methodists and clearly had a bias against the Textus Recentis, calling it villainous and vile. In case you forgot, that is the Greek text, the King James Bible was meticulously translated from. On top of all Westcott and Hort's bias against evangelical Christianity, they also delved into many dubious occult-based practices. In 1993, Gail Ripliner published New Age Bible versions. In this book, she alleges that Westcott and Hort were practitioners of the occult. It is indicated that they provide a bridge between apostate Christianity, the occult, and the New Age movement. But let's not just take Gail's word for it, and take a closer look for ourselves. To begin with, Bishop Edward White, Benson, Westcott and Hort founded the Ghostly Guild. This club was designed to investigate ghosts and supernatural appearances. The club was based upon the idea that such spirits actually exist and appear to men. According to the Encyclopedia of Occultism and Parapsychology, the members of the Ghostly Club would relate personal experiences, concerned with ghosts. This club, would eventually become the Society for Psychical Research. This club became a major factor in the rise of spiritualism among the elite of English society, in the late 1800s. Many leading occult figures belonged to the society. Westcott's son, refers to his father's lifelong faith in spiritualism. Archbishop Benson's son referred to Benson in the same way. According to Westcott's son, Arthur, Westcott practiced the communion of the saints. This was a belief that you can fellowship with the spirits of those who died recently. Westcott and Hort both joined a secret society called the Apostles. It was limited to 12 members. One of the other members, Henry Sidgwick, was also stated to have led several professors at Trinity College into secretly practicing the occult. Westcott, his close friend, was also a professor at Trinity College. Strange company, for a Christian teacher and Bible translator. In 1872, Westcott formed a secret society, the Uranus Club. Members included, Hort, Sidgwick, Arthur Balfour, 
future Prime Minister of England, Archbishop Trench, and Dean Alford. Both Trench and Alford would be involved in Bible revision work. Balfour became famous for his seances and practice of spiritualism. The Uranus Club would eventually become known as an occult secret society. Balfour and Sedgwick were involved in several occult organizations, socialism, and theosophy. How many Christians have so many friends prominent in the practice of the occult? Balfour would also be involved in the founding of the League of Nations, and forming a secret society with Cecil Rhodes, the Round Table, and the Council on Foreign Relations. And if that wasn't enough, In 1870, the English Parliament authorized a revision of the King James Bible. Two teams of translators were hired. Most translators were from the Church of England, but there were also seven Presbyterians, four Congregationalists, two Baptists, two Methodists, and one Unitarian. The translators were instructed to make as few alterations to the King James Bible as possible. Several thousand Church of England preachers signed a petition, protesting the inclusion of the Unitarian, Dr. Vance Smith, on the revision committee. They felt that only saved men should be involved in translating the Bible. Proper translation required the illumination of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Essential. Both Westcott and Hoard defended Smith and lobbied for his presence on the committee. Westcott threatened to quit if Smith was not included. Westcott and Hort supplied everyone working on the committee with a private copy of their new Greek text. Hort lobbied, some would say intimidated, committee members, to follow the Westcott and Hort text. Westcott, Hort, and Bishop Lightfoot, pressured the committee to go beyond their mandate for doing a revision of the King James Bible. Hort was far more concerned about his feelings than he was about the textual debate over any passage. Westcott referred to the debate over textual readings as hard fighting and a battle royale. The original chairman, Bishop Samuel Wilberforce, resigned after referring to the project as a most miserable business. Despite fierce opposition from the committee, Westcott and Hoard eventually won most of the debates. After the New English Revision was published, the people of England largely rejected the new translation. Attempts to make it the new authorized version of the Church of England met with such protest that Queen Victoria abandoned the idea. Neither the English nor the American Revision sold very well. They were both soon replaced by other versions. However, the multitude of New English versions were all based upon the same Westcott and Hoard Greek text and upon the theories of Westcott and Hort. Their English translation failed, but their principles won the day. Even though evangelicals rejected the English revision, and the Westcott and Hort text, it did find supporters. Modernists and rationalists, both within and outside the Church of England, praised their work. Theosophy founder, Helena Blavatsky, wrote at great length in praise of the new Greek, Coptic text. High Church, defenders of Westcott and Hort, claimed that the evangelicals were too simple-minded and unlearned to understand the work of Westcott and Hort and other English scholars. Evangelicalism was presented as unscholarly. After a generation, Many evangelicals began to feel uncomfortable at always being labeled as unscholarly and uneducated. Some evangelical leaders began to look for ways to reconcile the historic Christian faith with the theories of Westcott and Hort. These theories and the Greek text of Westcott and Hort began to find their way into evangelical seminaries and Bible colleges on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. Two generations after the failure of the English revision, the theories of Westcott and Hort had become majority opinion in evangelical Bible colleges and seminaries, in both the United States and England. Their theories were universally accepted in modernist seminaries. 
compromising evangelicals, were suddenly proud of having scholarship, accepted by the world. They used the same Greek text as the Roman Catholic Church, the Modernists, and the cults. A relative handful of Bible believers, refused to accept the Greek text and theory of Westcott and Hort. Such holdouts became an irritation to the scholarly, evangelicals. As study of the issue increased, opposition to the Westcott and Hort theory grew. Westcott and Hort only, no longer seemed an adequate reason for abandoning the King James Bible. The scholarly evangelicals began to react harshly to their King James only critics. Sounds familiar. And today, that same divide continues, which is not entirely surprising, because those who challenge the primacy of the King James Bible, and thus, the Textus Receptus, depend on the work of Westcott and Hort, so it becomes circular logic and reasoning. Westcott and Hort are not a sufficient basis to reject the Textus Receptus, or the King James Bible. Their objectivity, scholarship, and doctrine are all at best, suspect. There is no reason to believe that they were saved men. There is more reason to believe that they were influenced by the occult, than there is to believe that they were influenced by the Holy Spirit. Perhaps the King James only controversy, is misnamed. It is really a Westcott and Hort only, controversy. After all, it's not so much about favoritism, it's about truth. How do I feel about it? It has taught me to be more vigilant, and careful in what I accept as true and complete. I think it's fair to say that the KJV is not without its problems either, but there's no escaping the fact that it is based upon as close to the truth as we can get in English. The fact that it comes under such attack, bears testimony to that. Sometimes the archaic language in the KJV can be hard to understand and sometimes it uses words like arrow, instead of missile, and bow, instead of launcher etc., but nevertheless, knowing what I know now, I will always use it as a reference before checking the original source, to ensure I have the complete picture, and not just part of it. This is not so much a KGAV promo video, but rather to give some insight into the history of the situation, and the need to be careful as to what we accept as a true, and complete message. I'm not afraid to refer to other Bible versions, and often do, but I always check that what I want to say, is being conveyed in completeness, and as close to the true meaning as is possible. BibleHub.com, is a site I often use as it shows most of the common versions side by side, to give a quick reference of accuracy. I feel I should apologize for this, what may seem a heavy video, with so much text, but I can't, as this is something the Lord brought to me and I have to bring his truth, no matter what. For those of you who have watched, thank you for hanging in there, and I hope that for some, it has brought a new level of understanding. God bless you, and be with you.